kind of consequences that it's imposed on people all over the world. I mean, we need to understand this language. We need to understand what it does, and we need to understand it in terms of its project, as a mode of public pedagogy, and we need to understand it in terms of the social cost that it reproduces. Secondly, I want to talk about the war on youth. And what I want to talk about is what I call the soft war and the hard war, and I'll explain those terms at the end. But it seems to me that one of the things that the left, unfortunately, globally, has not, at least for me, taken seriously enough is the question of youth, and the question of the war on youth. We talk about race, we talk about class, we talk about gender, we talk about disability, we talk about a whole range of issues that truly matter, but somehow it seems to me that youth are often left out of this, of this discourse. And one wonders if that's because we actually are mimicking something that neoliberalism wants us to mimic, and that is not thinking about what it means to talk about the future. Finally, I'm going to talk basically about what I call the politics of educated hope. In, in at least trying to, in some way, make clear that any notion of any notion of politics that matters has to make education central to its development. You can, and I'm, and I'm not simply talking about school. I'm talking about what it means to create a, what I would call the formative culture that makes it possible to raise the questions that we need to raise and then act on in order to do something about a future that we believe should be ours and not theirs. There's an overwhelming catalog of evidence that reveals that many neoliberal societies are at war with their children, and that the use of such violence against young people is a disturbing index of a society that is in the midst of a deep moral and political crisis. Young people today live in an era of foreclosed hope, an era in which it's difficult to imagine a life beyond capitalism, or to get beyond the fear that any attempt to do so can only result in a more dreadful nightmare. Beyond exposing the moral depravity of a society that fails to protect its youth, the symbolic and real violence waged against many young people today speaks to nothing less than a perverse collective death wish, especially in light of the fact that, as Alan Vado argues, we live in an era in which there is near zero tolerance for democratic protest and infinite tolerance for the crimes of bankers and government embezzlers which affect the lives of millions. This is certainly true in the United States. How else to explain the Obama administration's willingness to label as a traitor William Snowden, a young man who bravely spoke out against secret government surveillance and the mining of private information for millions of Americans, and I'm sure Canadians, while at the same time the U.S. government refused to press criminal charges against the banking giant HBSC for laundering billions of dollars for Mexican drug cartels and terrorist groups linked to Al-Qaeda. In countries around the world, not just the United States, poor minority and low-income youth, especially those from marginalized ethnic and indigenous groups, are often warehoused in schools that resemble boot camps, dispersed to dank and dangerous workplaces far from the enclaves of the tourist industries, incarcerated in prisons that favor punishment over rehabilitation and consigned to the increasing army of the permanently unemployed, rendered, re rendered redundant as a result of the collapse or the absence of the social state, pervasive racism, a growing disparity in income and wealth, and a profit at all costs neoliberal mindset, an increasing number of individuals and groups are being demonized, criminalized, and simply abandoned because they lack status as middle-class taxpayers or they don't fit into a public sphere defined largely as white and Christian. Their ranks are filled with non-citizens, in quotation marks, immigrants and refugees, aboriginal people, young people, the elderly, the poor, the unemployed, the disabled, the homeless, and of course the working poor who cannot secure a living wage. These people have become invisible in the public discourse and occupy what Zhao Biel has called zones of terminal exclusion, which exacerbate the disposability of the unwanted. 
people who are once viewed as facing dire problems in need of state intervention and social protection are now seen as a problem threatening society. This becomes clear when the war on poverty is transformed into a war against the poor, when the plight of the homeless is defined less as a political and economic issue in need of social reform than as a matter of law and order, or when the government budgets for prison construction eclipse the funds for higher education. Indeed, the transformation of the social state into the corporate controlled punishing state is made starkly clear when young people, to paraphrase W.E.B. Du Bois, become problem people rather than people who face problems. Young people, especially low-income and poor minorities, are now viewed as trouble rather than being seen as trouble. And as such, they're increasingly subject to the dictates of a criminal justice system rather than receiving assistance from social programs that could address their most basic needs already disenfranchised by virtue of their age. Young people are under assault today in ways that are entirely new because they now face a world that is far more dangerous than at any other time in recent history. Not only do they live in a space of social homelessness in which precarity and uncertainty lock them out of a secure future, they also find themselves inhabiting a society that seeks to silence them as it makes them invisible. Victims of a neoliberal regime that smashes their hopes and denies them the exercise of their democratic rights, young people are told not to expect too much. Written out of any claim to the economic and social resources of the larger society, they're increasingly told to accept the status of being stateless, faceless, and functionless, nomads, a plight for which they alone have to accept responsibility. And included here are not only homeless youth, but youth who are and youth who are incarcerated and youth who live in dire poverty, but also a growing mass of young people suffering mental anguish and overt distress, seen now among the college bound, debt ridden, and unemployed, whose numbers, as the mainstream media recently noted, are growing exponentially in Canada, in the United States, and elsewhere. I can't think of a better way to diffuse the possibility among young people of the radical imagination and to place them into so much debt that for the next 20 years all they can basically think about is paying that debt back. That's an assault. That's an assault not simply on what we might call subjecting them to a kind of economic servitude that's an assault on the very nature of what it means to be able to think otherwise in order to act otherwise. To reverse the play of youth and to move beyond the cynicism and moral paralysis often triggered by dystopian nightmares concerning the future, it seems to me it's crucial to understand and resist the larger social conditions and historical shifts whose direct impacts we are witnessing, witnessing and feeling so acutely at this historical moment all over the world. The forces of neoliberalism are on the march, dismantling the historically guaranteed social provisions provided by the welfare straight state, defining profit making as the essence of democracy, increasing the role of corporate money in politics, waging an assault on unions, denigrating public servants and public goods, allowing public transportation to deteriorate, and expanding, of course, the military industrial security surveillance state, promoting the erosion of civil liberties, undercutting public faith in the defining institutions of democracy, and overseeing widening social inequality. Right-wing ideologues in Canada and the United States and elsewhere now deploy the discourse of austerity to gut the social provisions for young people, limit aid for higher education, build prisons to incarcerate poor minority youth, and talk about passing laws in which young children who are poor and get free meals have to perform menial labor in order to pay for their school lunches. That's no lie, by the way. That's Newt Gingrich. The language of command now rules most public and private spaces, a language in which there is little room for dialogue, critical thought, and the development of cultural questioning. 
This is the vocabulary of neoliberal structural violence, using the fear of state terrorism to stifle the subtle work that goes on here, the work of interpretation and dissent while promoting a form of collective stupidity. Today's young people inhabit an age of unprecedented symbolic, what we, what we might call material and institutional violence, an age of monopoly power, grotesque irresponsibility, unrestrained greed, and unchecked individualism. Under such circumstances, all bets are off regarding the future of democracy. Besides a growing inability to translate private problems into social issues, what is being lost in the current conjuncture is the very idea of the public good. The notion of connecting learning to social change and developing modes of civic courage infused by the principles of social justice under the regime of what Mike Davis calls a savage financial capitalism with its contemporary dream worlds of consumption, power, and poverty, we are witnessing the crumbling of social bonds and the triumph of individual desires over social rights. Nowhere is this more evident than in the gated communities, the gated institutions, and the gated values that have become symptomatic of a society or societies that have lost their claims to democracy, or for that matter, any sense of utopian possibility. The eminent sociologist Sigmund Bauman is right in claiming that visions have nowadays fallen into dis disrepute and we tend to be proud of what we should be ashamed of. Politics has become an extension of war, just as the state-sponsored violence increasingly finds legitimation in popular culture and a broader culture of cruelty that promotes an expanding landscape of fear and undermines any sense of communal responsibility for the well-being of others. Indeed, the broader culture increasingly provides legitimation for many get-tough policies that now render young people as criminals, deprive them of basic health, education, and social services. We all know the script. Today, many young people are nearly destroyed by a social order that either views them as the prime target of the neoliberal punishing state or expects them to inhabit a set of relations in which the obligations of citizenship are reduced to the obligations of consumer culture. And what I want to do is I want to interrogate this insult, this intensifying insult on youth by talking about what I call the soft war and the hard war. The idea of the soft war considers the changing conditions of youth within the relentless expansion of what we might call a global market society. Partnered with a massive advertising machinery, the soft war targets all youth, devaluing them by treating them as just another market to be commodified and exploited and conscripting them into the system through the relentless attempts to create a new generation of consuming subjects. This low intensity war is waged by a variety of corporate institutions to the educational force of a culture that commercializes every aspect of kids' lives and now uses the internet and various social networks along with the new media technologies such as cell phones to immerse young people in a world of mass consumption in a ways that are more direct and expansive than anything we have ever seen in the past. I mean, what happens with these big corporations now is they simply bypass parents. You know, I mean, they have kids, they ask kids, for instance, to type in their, their telephone numbers or to type in their email numbers, and they deal with them directly. And sometimes they can't even get out of a website that they link into these commercialized websites unless they do that. The influence of the new screen technology and electronic culture on young people that, and, its, and its effect on young people is, is often disturbing. For instance, a study by the Kaiser Family Foundation found that young people ages 8 to 18, with the exception of course of everybody in this room, now spend more than seven and a half hours a day with smartphones, computers and televisions, and other electronic devices, compared with six and a half hours five years ago. That's a big difference. When you, when you add the additional time youth spend texting, talking on their cell phones and doing multiple tasks at once, such as watching TV while updating Facebook, the number rises to 11 hours of total media content a day. Corporations have hit gold with the new media and can inundate young people directly with their market-driven values, desires, and identities, all of which fly under the radar, escaping the watchful eyes and interventions of concerned parents, educators, adults, and others. The data mining makers, the data mining marketeers make young people think that they count when in fact all they really want to do is count them. 
And as Bauman points out, life in politics are now shaped after the likeness of the means of the objects of consumption, as evident in dominant cultures, selective elimination and rendering of, the, of all kinds of possible modes of political and social and ethical vocabularies that could be made available to youth. There is also the issue of how mass culture is drawing an entire generation into a world of consumption in which commodities and brand loyalty become the most important matters of, of, of identity and the primary frameworks for mediating one's relationship to the world. And increasingly, it seems many young people can recognize themselves in terms preferred by the body. Of course, some young people are doing their best to resist the commercial onslaught and to stay ahead of the commodification and the privatization of the new media. These youth are using social and digital media as creative tools, as we all know, to assert a range of oppositional practices and forms of protest that constitute a new form of political activity, which I'll return to when I, when I conclude. But I, I guess the point that I want to make about the soft wall, this is an educational wall. This is a form of public pe pe pedagogy on the side of authoritarianism. This is a form of public pedagogy that is being waged by corporations because they know that they not only, in, in a sense, have to extract profits from people and groups and individuals, but they also have to stifle the creative impulses of young people. I mean, when I read about the Snowden incident, the, something that caught my eye that was absolutely stunning was there was a general talking about Snowden, and his comment was, the problem with Snowden and his generation is not that they they simply know these new technologies better than we do. The problem is they question authority. And I, and, I, and, I, and I guess the key here is what they get and we sometimes don't get is that the subjects that are going to be produced, the desires that are going to be mobilized, the notion, notions of agency that are in some way going to be shaped are absolutely central to neoliberal politics. They're concerned about agents. And they want agents who are basically going to be do nothing more than mimic the logic of the market. That's what they want. Shut up and buy. Sell and, and you know go shopping. We have a major tragedy, for instance, in the United States, and Bush Light says we can deal with this. Go shopping. Or in any any other major event, you can always measure a, pol a politician's integrity because what they often say when they really are in trouble, they'll say, "Go to Disney World." <laughs> The environment's being polluted, go to Disney World. You know, I mean, it's become like a mantra for a kind of stupidity for which the market takes pride. Turning now to the hard war, and this is the more serious and dangerous development for young people, especially those who are marginalized by virtue of their ethnicity, race, and class. The hard war refers to the harshest elements of a growing youth crime control complex that operates through the logic of punishment, surveillance, and control. The young people targeted by its punitive measures are often poor minority youth who are, not, who, are, who are considered failed consumers and can only afford to live in the margins of commercial culture of excess that eagerly excludes anybody without the resources, the money, and the leisure time to spare. Or their youth considered uneducated and unemployable and therefore troublesome. The imprint of the youth control complex can be seen in the increasingly popular practices of organizing schools through disciplinary practices that subject students to constant surveillance through high-tech security devices while imposing on them the harsh and often thoughtless zero tolerance policies that clearly resemble measures used by the criminal justice system. In this instance, poor and minority youth become the subject of a new mode of governance based on the crudest forms of disciplinary control. Punished if they don't show up at school and punished if they do attend school. Many of these students are ushered into what has ominously been called the school to prison pipeline. If middle and ruling class if, 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 if middle and ruling class students are subject to the seduction of the market of market driven public relations, working class and poor minority youth a court in the, in the ship from what we might call the arousal of commodified desire to the harsh practices of securitization, surveillance, and policing. Made evident not only in the killing, made evident of course in the killing of this young Syrian boy recently, but also in, in, the, in the, the infamous killing of 17-year-old Trayvon Martin, along with a growing number of young people shot and killed in the streets of Chicago and Toronto. Poor minority youth are not just increasingly prevented from pursuing their dreams and aspirations, 
but are relegated to a type of social death defined as waste products of a society that no longer considers them of any value. There, there are more young people shot dead in the streets of Chicago in 2012 than American soldiers killed in Afghanistan. Not to deny our differences, we can un understand their strengths and their limitations in terms of larger social issues that look at the totality of society because I'm not just interested in getting rid of racism, I'm interested in getting rid of an authoritarian state as well. I'm not interested in just getting rid of the economic injustices. I'm also interested in creating the kind of life in which people have access to all the goods that they need so that their dignity is, in, is intact in ways that allows them to fulfill the promise of what it means to be alive and to live with dignity is truly an agent. And I'm also concerned, as we all are, not just about an economic rationality that is destructive and cruel, but I'm also concerned about a culture of cruelty in which all forms of social dependency are not just seen as, as, as something to be outward, but are actually seen as a pathology. I mean, we live in a time when we, that there is something about this system, unlike any other system I've seen in my lifetime, which produces a culture that is so cruel, so pathological in its hatred of the other, so, how might you say it, anti-democratic in its disregard for social dependencies, that it represents the worst form of authoritarianism. It's authoritarianism with a smile, you know, a happy day. Enjoy yourself, have a nice day, but you're just going to do it alone. And it seems to me, until we can resurrect this sense of democratic community and responsibility, until we can talk about education being linked to social change, until we can talk about education that in a fundamental way takes the dreams and the voices of young people seriously, provides the conditions for teachers and those in other cultural spheres, artists and intellectuals, to be able to work with dignity, I think we're in trouble. Thank you.